and, and welcome to the Digital Rights Watch um, facial recognition discussion panel this afternoon. Thanks for coming along and joining us. I'm Lily Ryan. Um, I'm a technologist, a digital security consultant and a member of the Digital Rights Watch board based here in, in Melbourne. And um, I'm hosting the panel today. And today we're also joined by three other panelists. Uh, we've got Catherine Gledel-Tucker, Jake Goldenfein, and Ariel Bogle. I'd like to get all of my panelists to introduce themselves. Um, but before I do that, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on, of all of the lands that uh, we're meeting on today. And I'd pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to the Aboriginal elders of any of the other communities who might be here today. Okay, so um, I think I'll kick it over first. Uh, we'll go alphabetically. So Ariel, could you please uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Ariel, I'm a technology reporter with the ABC and have been reporting on technology, privacy, data and all the rest for a few years now. Um, most recently, I was the technology editor at The Conversation. So that's me. All right, um, Jake. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Jake Goldenfein. I'm a law and technology scholar. I'm currently uh, finishing up a postdoctoral fellowship at um, Cornell Tech in a place called the Digital Life Initiative, which is um, uh, a mixed group of philosophers, lawyers, information scientists, and computer scientists who work on uh, the, the politics of digital technologies. And I'll be starting a position at Melbourne Law School on the faculty later in the year. Right, and yep, sorry, I'm, on, Catherine. sorry, I'm Catherine. Uh, I'm a First Nations technologist and activist uh, working in uh, technology on Wajuk Noonga Buja. Um, so with a little bit too much knowledge around technology and facial recognition, and I'm just a bit scared about it. Well, that's uh, probably a good segue into what we're here to talk about today, which is facial recognition technology. Um, we could call it facial recognition, face rec, a lot of different kinds of names and terms get used. A lot of different kinds of technologies get used to do the same kinds of things. Um, but we're talking about mostly technology that gets used on members of the public in public spaces um, to recognize their faces and connect them with their identities, very broadly speaking. Um, I want to distinguish this uh, from the kinds of technologies that we talk about when we're talking about using facial recognition to unlock a phone, for example, um, just so that we're clear on the kinds of tech that we're talking about when, we, when we're addressing these sorts of questions. And it's been, <laughs> it's been a hot topic for a little while now. And we're in an interesting time at the moment. I'm here in Victoria where we're all wearing masks out in public, which is something we'll probably get into a little later because that has an impact on the way that we can uh, be recognized, which, was, which is interesting to dig into. But uh, politically speaking, um, there have been plans for a while to introduce a national facial recognition system. Um, those plans have been going back and forth between parliamentary committees and other parties to try and work out whether we can implement that, how we implement that, what that looks like. And broadly speaking, we've seen it in, uh, used by, by law enforcement, we've seen it used by private enterprise and in a lot of different places. There are a lot of facets to the topic, um, but I thought uh, we might kick off by talking about um, one of the biggest ones, which is the inaccuracies that some of these technologies have, um, racial biases and other issues around discrimination. So firstly, I'd like to um, address the first question to Catherine. So while facial recognition and the debate around it has been going for a while, um, you know, it's now receiving reinvigorated attention through the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, where the technology is being called out for bolstering state surveillance and is exacerbating uh, police brutality. So um, attention is also being drawn to the, to the racial bias that currently exists with most facial recognition algorithms and its impact on black people, particularly in the United States. Bringing this discussion into an Australian context, what's your perspective on the implications of facial recognition and its harms, uh, particularly with regard to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples? Uh, 
as well as many immigrant and refugee communities. Thanks, Lily. Firstly, I'm just really glad that we're contextualizing this conversation at all uh, in regards to the Black Lives Matter movement and initiatives to closing the gap for our Aboriginal communities. And we need to recognize that applications of technology and especially face rec or whatever we want to call it isn't neutral. And the first people who are going to be impacted are already marginalized members of our community. Uh, who are very familiar with being over-policed and surveilled. And if we are committed to closing the gap in this country, and part of closing the gap is addressing the over-representation of Aboriginal people in our police system, then that reality isn't really compatible with rampant police surveillance. I, I should also add, and I should have said this a little earlier, if anybody has any questions um, attending the panel, please feel free to put them into the, into the chat. Um, and we will get to them at appropriate junctures in the conversation, but we'll take those as they, as they come. Um, so does anyone have any, anything particular to follow on to what Catherine's saying at that point? I can add Maybe there's a couple of ways that um, this, this manifests as well. And I think we'll jump into the kinds of um, underlying biases that come with uh, applying artificial intelligence to social issues. But I mean, we know facial recognition technology uh, exhibit systemic racial bias and are famously pretty terrible at correctly identifying people of color. And we know that there's a risk of artificial intelligence of any kind, and especially surveillance, fundamentally amplifying these kind of underlying conditions of data. And the underlying conditions in Australia are that Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people composite 2% of our general population and somehow over a quarter of our prison population. And that's only going to be amplified when we kind of throw technology on top of it. Um, it's particularly interesting to think about in the context of the recent discussion about um, raising the age as well and the way that facial recognition has been shown historically not to work so well on children, particularly as they grow and they change, um, face shapes differ. Um, different technologies have absolutely got different kinds of accuracy levels when it comes to that, but a lot of the more commonly available ones do tend to uh, fail pretty, pretty hard when it comes to recognizing pictures of children in terms of specific individuals. So it's probably interesting to, I think, explore the connection there as well. All right. Um, I'm still getting used to the cadence of doing this all online. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it long enough that you'd think that, but... Um, I think uh, what we'll do in the absence of anybody else wanting to jump in at any point, and please feel free to do so if you have anything else to say, um, I might address the next question to Jake. Um, so um, still on the topic of, of inaccuracies, while it's uh, well known that the technology itself is flawed and biased, it can result in these false positives. Um, you know, we've seen this in the recent arrest of a man in Detroit based on facial recognition that identified him as somebody else. Um, concerns around the accuracy and discriminatory outcomes of facial recognition are valid, but even if the technological issues were fixed, is this enough to prevent the harm that's caused by facial recognition? If the technology worked perfectly, is it ever possible for facial recognition to be used safely and ethically within a liberal society? Just, you know, a light question <laughs> for you. Just a, just a light question. Look, it's a really complex issue. Facial recognition can clearly be harmful if it doesn't work, and it can clearly be harmful if it works. Um, there's also this question of what it means to say, like, if the technology works perfectly, like, what does, what does that mean? Like, is the te technology satisfying the agenda of the designer? Well, you know, that might be the case, and we've had examples for of, like, predictive policing risk assessment tools in, used in New South Wales that heavily policed Indigenous people um, disproportionately was that the technology working as it was supposed to or not. So 
Um, what it means for the technology to work, I think, is, is, is actually a really complicated question. Um, are, there, are there like social rationales for use of facial technology, uh, facial recognition technology at all? Um, probably there might be, yes. Probably there are situations in which there's a, a reason to use it. Um, but do we exist in a political environment where it can be deployed in a way that's sort of collectively democratically governed? Um, that I don't, I don't really think so. And I mean, you say like in a, in a liberal society, um, like or used ethically in a liberal society, I think also this idea of, you know, the way liberal ethics gets translated into protecting us from these kinds of technologies is, is frequently in terms of like whether us as individuals consent. And I think what we really need is more sort of collective discussions about what we really want. And sometimes when, you know, we, we encounter facial recognition technology being um, proposed by the government as like a solution to identity fraud or, or, or terrorism, for instance. Um, and then the sort of academic or an activist community sort of responding saying, no, 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 we need privacy rights to sort of curtail these abuses. We actually, we leave out a big part of the conversation, which is like, what do we actually want? And like, what can we do? And how do we govern this collectively? So, sorry, a complex answer to a complex question. It is, um, I mean, it is the right question to be asking though, what, what do we want and what do we mean? And I think that the, the issue of consent is also, it can be quite murky depending on how, how it's interpreted as well. Um, it does have a lot of cultural implications in different places that don't always translate. And so that, mm. can, be, that can be tricky to codify, I think, if we're talking about actual regulation. Um, I'll address my next question to Ariel. Um, this one is more around um, the media and the way that the media portrays the public discussion around facial recognition, um, which is mostly that most of this discussion tends to be dominated by the US narrative. And what's your opinion on the level of public discussion in Australia compared to overseas contexts when it comes to facial recognition? Yeah, I mean, just, um sort of cursory look so does suggest that in the discourse is a little more, um, it's a little more uh, advanced, I suppose, in the United States, that um, question that Jake raised around like, do we even know what we want facial recognition to do? Have we discussed what it would mean in our society? I feel like we're not quite there. And there's a, probably a, a set of factors there and the media is certainly one. I do feel like the media too often covers facial recognition as something that's happening over there, quote unquote, you know, it's something that affects uh, black communities in the United States over there. It's, it's part of the um, Chinese social credit system in China. It's not really something that happens here. I think that's kind of been for too long the frame that the Australian media uses when we come, when it comes to facial recognition. It, it is changing somewhat, but I mean, we can go on forever about the limitations of the media, but I do think there's an issue here with a lack of technology literacy amongst um, Australian technology journalists and a, a lack of context in history because often when facial recognition is covered here in Australia, it's covered as either, you know, some miracle technology that's going to let you into a cricket game without a ticket or it's some catastrophic uh, George Orwell type um, situation going on in one particular pet police department or one particular part of Australia. And it's really placed in a kind of overall context of Australian policing or the history of surveillance capitalism in general. So I, there's a lot we could improve on, certainly. I know I'll put myself there too. I can always be improving on this as well because it's hard to stick with these topics. I think we're going to talk about transparency a little later, but actually it's very hard uh, for the media to cover some of this stuff because the Australian transparency system around policing is uh, a, there's a strong veil over it, in, in, to put it lightly. Yeah, um, that one's always gonna be really tricky as well. It's not like one particular party can influence the laws on the entire system. I think that, um, you know, as long as we're all together and trying to come, to get, uh, come to a resolution that works for everybody, um, that will help, but 
it does, I know that the media does have, you know, a particular role to play, generally speaking, in how it's perceived overall. Technical literacy is an issue here, um, also with a few other things these days, as it becomes, <laughs> as it becomes more part of our lives, technology in general. Um, just having a look at some of the questions. Um, one moment. Lucy's made a, a good point here um, when she asks, is there a difference uh, being drawn between live facial recognition tracking in cities, public spaces, and so-called retrospective facial recognition used by law enforcement? And do we feel better about one or the other? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I've got my own thoughts about that, but I can put that to the panel, I think, more broadly. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I'd, I'd say that there isn't so much of a delineation between the two as well. Uh, these kind of smart cities projects that tend to pop up that Perth is trialling at the moment is pretty inextricably linked with police surveillance. Um, there's this kind of sale around, oh, we're going to uh, use Internet of Things and CCTV and surveillance to be able to measure thoroughfares and how many people are walking along a bridge. And that seems pretty innocuous, but it's just a really easy way to kind of sell surveillance as a, a, a neutral thing to apply to a city. But the technology and the, the data handling is so easily applied to police surveillance. I, I don't think they can be, can be kind of torn apart. Yeah, that's that, that's a I, I agree completely. Um, I do think that like built into the sort of real time tracking scenario is kind of this um, idea, fantasy, mythology about automation that uh, doesn't exist in some of the other applications. You know, automated uh, real time tracking facilitates like automated access and denial. Uh, facilitates like you know automatic alerts to put for policing and so there is there is something different going on when we start talking about um real time versus retrospective tracking but in reality much of that automation really is like fantasy stuff and it's just this sort of like idea of what perfect policing would be and in their true applications they would look kind of similar like uh police would go back to the databases that are logging people's locations and things like they've been doing for years anyway. Do you have any particular thoughts, Ariel? Um, not on that point, yeah, I, but I do That's agree. Right. There, I do agree about the fantasy element. I mean, just to come back to media coverage, so much of the, I mean, I would just give you a glimpse of my inbox whenever facial recognition comes around the press releases from technology companies claiming the claims they make about what their technology can do as opposed to how they can operate in practice or the author, you know, the claims of efficacy, the claims of accuracy, it's all feels like we're still in the realm of fantasy, to be honest. Yeah. Um, from, from my own point of view, looking at the, the technology side of things, um, it's interesting to note that particularly with the protests, protests that happened in Hong Kong, fairly recently, um, doesn't feel like recently, but a lot has happened this year. Um, a lot of people were, were covering their faces, not just because they were worried about facial recognition being performed while they were protesting, but also because they're worried about high resolution images being taken of the protests and being used later to identify people who are at those protests. So happening, things happening live and having cameras that have the capability built in is absolutely one thing. Um, what I'm interested in is how the discussion can move when it, we come to talking about cameras in general, because this is a technology that can be applied to, to the images themselves. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter if the camera has that capability on board and they're more expensive when they do, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it without it at that point. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Got a few more questions rolling in, but for the moment, I wanna to jump to um, the topic of Clearview AI, which is something that's come up in the chat a little bit already. Um, and I'll address this one to Jake specifically. So 
one of the things that we that has stood out in, in Australia in particular is the creation of Clearview AI because it's an Australian who has had a great hand in that. Um, so from your perspective, can you give a bit of an overview of what Clearview AI is, um, how it's used, how it works, and um, what are the some what are some of the implications of it being used by police in Australia? Sure. Um, so I suppose typically when we think of something like facial recognition, uh, a, a big part of it is the enrollment of images. So you start from a point of having an identified image of a person and then um, a facial recognition system is, is effectively uh, checking an image to see if it matches an image of a person that you have in the database. Um, so, for instance, I think you flagged, you want to talk about it later, the Australian identity matching services, the capability. This whole thing is about who has control over driver's license images, um, which would be used as the identified images to, 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 to be matched against in the system. Now, Clearview AI has kind of come along and exploded all of that because what they've done is scraped, you know, billions of images off the public web and built these databases, not of identified images, but of images that are recorded with like a web address. And so you use the same sort of garden variety facial recognition algorithms um, on any, on, on an image that you upload. So if you're a policeman, you might have a, a police person, you'll have a, an image, you'll upload it to the app and it will run that image against its database and then return matches and the web addresses. So not necessarily identified, but they'll give you a good, um, a good lead on trying to identify the person. Uh, so, you know, so much of our like uh, human rights jurisprudence has been about control of like police images and things like that. And, and privacy law has for a long time sort of talked about how, well, you can, you know, police agencies are entitled to um, retain images of people who have been convicted of offences. So we have like mugshot databases and things. And then even the, the, ident the, the National Identity Services Matching Bill is very much about, you know, these, these civic images and it's like broadening out the, 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 the picture. But now we have a technology that can do it really on, on, on public web images, which really involves almost everybody. Um, and it uh, changes things pretty significantly. One in the, in the sense that it's a private company that's doing this. That's not to say that private companies aren't involved up and down the surveillance food chain in Australia, but here they've sort of developed a, a standalone service. So you don't have to have any of the political discussion around the sort of infrastructures to facilitate this that we're otherwise seeing. You can just have police providing a, a police email address and getting access to this to this technology. And then what we're seeing is problems like they're lying about the fact that they're using it. Um, and so whatever rules uh, or policies might get developed about the appropriate use of technologies within these policing contexts sort of get sidelined because there's this sort of like really handy application that does a relatively good job of doing what the police want to do, you know, and they're just like, doing the thing that they want to do, which is, you know, solve crimes, I suppose, and gen generously, a, gen <laughs> um, a generous characterization of what they're doing. But yeah, so it changes things pretty significantly. And I think it's been really problematic that um, Australian policing agencies have not been honest about their use of it. Um, and Ariel, from your point of view, um, one of the one of the big issues here, aside from the ethical issues of Clearview AI itself, is the lack of the transparency around the ways that police are using it. So, from your perspective as a journalist, um, reporting on this has to be pretty difficult um, when it's not even clear the extent to which it's being used. So, how has your experience been when it comes to extracting information about the use of facial recognition by law enforcement in Australia? Well, yeah, I guess I'll give a bit of a timeline um, of the Clearview AI reporting I've done just off the back of what Jake was saying, because uh, you might remember back in January, there's, there's that quite blockbuster report in the New York Times describing Clearview. I mean, police knew about it at the time, maybe some academics knew, but for the most part, it was kind of a, a secret, not a secret, but pretty much unknown in general to the public. So that was a huge story that really provoked interest of course, it was interesting from the start that the creator was Australian. 
it seemed to flag that there were police forces outside the United States using it. And so probably, you know, a dozen journalists in Australia emailed all the police departments in Australia, including the Australian Federal Police, to be to ask if they're using it. I mean, in general, you got pretty nothing answers back, which is pretty par for the course when you ask any police department what technology they're using in any capacity. But the federal police were interesting in that they did deny using it. So fast forward a few months later, and uh, Clearview actually suffered a data breach in which a lot of client lists were lost. And on those lists that turned up in BuzzFeed, turns out there were some Australian federal police emails listed there. It was not really until a question on notice from Mark Dreyfus, um, the shadow attorney general in, the, um, in a parliamentary committee hearing, that the federal police had to answer um, a question on notice around, were they using Clearview full stop? And they had to come back and say yes. I mean, in the mix of this, back actually FOI'd any records that the federal police had about Clearview in January, like the, the same day, maybe the next day after that New York Times story. And they denied the request saying they had no documents. But it turned out that some part of the federal police, the, uh, the center for, uh, that looks after child exploitation um, investigations, some staff there had actually been using it. So it's taken from then an FOI refusal, the question on notice from Mark Dreyfus, they had to reopen the FOI request because they had said publicly at that point that they had used it all the way to just a few weeks ago where you got, I got a dump of hundreds of documents at 5 p.m., I think, like on a Thursday night. Heavily redacted still, but nevertheless sort of showed how Clearview had sort of travelled through the Australian Federal Police. And it was pretty much, as Jake described, some people trying a tool without any sort of permissions given, without any scrutiny of the security of the device. I mean, it seemed like some staff maybe even had it on their personal phones without permission from whoever does the ICT at the Federal Police. Um, and they were using it, testing it on themselves, testing it on photos, and images related to cases. So it really is, it provides a pretty messy picture of how an off the shelf facial recognition solution can suddenly start being used by the federal police without any scrutiny whatsoever. That was quite long, but sorry, <laughs> this is my immense frustration. <laughs> yeah, that, I can sense that. <laughs> Can I add one thing? Of course. I, I, I also found it completely striking that the police were willing to um, use a tool that would disclose to a private company who, would, who they were investigating. Absolutely. And to me, this is yeah. like a, 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 an incredibly problematic, uh, I mean, I think you could call it data breach, depending or, on- Or, I mean, project. at worst, we don't really know, but it could also include images of children who were affect, being exploited in some fashion in an attempt to find their identities too. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that the police weren't cognizant of that suggests that they're not even capable of evaluating their own use of these technologies. And so, yeah, this accountability problem is really uh, deep. Um, just uh, going back to a question that we had, um, I can't recall now if it's in the chat or if it's in the Q&A. We've had quite a lot of traffic there so far, which has been great. Thank you for being engaged. Um, in the audience, and I have read all of these. I'm getting to some of them, and some of them I'll leave for some question and answer time at the end if we have some left over. Um, but yeah, it is um, interesting to think about the focus that we have on law enforcement and facial recognition. But does anyone have any particular thoughts on the concerns that might happen around? As, as Jake says, private enterprise being involved in these kinds of things, not just private enter enterprise and law enforcement, but also private enterprise generally and other big companies um, that have these issues with facial recognition and how they're being used in, in the country, in fact, around the world. Um, does anyone have any feelings or thoughts on the particular point of companies using facial recognition as opposed to law enforcement and whether that's any better or worse? I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think you could say it's better. <laughs> it's probably, it's hard to assess what worse means, I guess, in this context. I mean, a lot of people, there was probably a lot of notice a few, maybe a month ago now when it seemed like some 7-Eleven stores were using it, I think as part of like a, a customer satisfaction survey, which seemed like quite a, um, you, 
needlessly um, high tech way to do a customer satisfaction survey. Um, but yes, of course, I mean, a lot, it's especially noticeable among in sort of the smart city context or in the way that so many of our public spaces are in fact private spaces that of course um, the use of facial recognition um, should be just as scrutinized when it's used by private enterprise uh, because it, it's not I don't know how distinguishable the two are certainly uh, facial recognition technology used on a private property can immediately be used for law enforcement if they wish to um, and you know it's, it's sort of a just a cog in the system from what I understand. Yeah, I agree. I think it's um, symptomatic as well of this kind of, um, we tend to look at technology as unbridled opportunity instead of tempering those conversations with risk and liability, and especially for anybody working in public or private sectors, it's, I, I only ever see data collection and data handling as risk, but that's not the case for a lot of people who, who work in tech. Um, so I think there is, and this comes into uh, the conversation about tech literacy as well in, in our country and in our industries, but there's a gap between how we use tech every day and how we would use tech if we had a, a lens and a mind of, okay, how do we avoid any kind of systemic um, biases that are going to negatively impact our, our communities? I think we would act pretty differently. I suppose like, I, I, I see the, 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 the participation of private industry in this, um, to be like exactly as as Ariel suggested, sort of indistinguishable from the the law enforcement or government applications. In a lot of ways, like you know, there's been this big discussion about ban facial recognition, and then uh, Microsoft and Amazon and IBM hop on and they say like, yeah, yeah, ban facial recognition until we can regulate it. The the the, the reason for that is they don't really care about facial recognition. Selling the actual facial recognition algorithm is cheap. What they care about is being the infrastructure and platform provider for all of the data collection, video analytics, cloud storage, um, and everything else that goes on because it's in all of those data collection and processing operations that they can extract rents from governments and generate political surplus that's going to get them more government contracts down, down the line. So, um, I think that when we think about like what are private companies doing we need to understand it in that way and 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 i think that translates into sort of non-government applications of the technologies as well if we're talking about commercial applications and things the the interest of private companies here is becoming an infrastructure and collecting rents off the users and not so much um you know we're gonna like solve shopping for you or anything like that <laughs> That's such a good point. These supply chains, we tend to focus so much on Clearview or the specific companies that are owning the algorithms or are engaging directly with um, government ag agencies or law enforcement or private enterprise. But everything's going to be hosted on AWS or Azure at some point and Microsoft and Amazon and IBM still get to be a part of the game. They just don't need to wear the, the risk of media coverage, which seems a bit disingenuous. Okay. Um, one of the next questions I had was for you, Captain, actually, um, which was about your involvement in the community pushback against facial recognition in Perth. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there have been some freedom of information requests, among other things. Um, and there's been some discussion in the chat as well, talking about, you know, banning facial recognition. What does good facial recognition look like? How would we think about it um, ethically and what the community actually wants? Um, and from your point of view, what do you think the role is of collective community action and grassroots action in this space? Um, how can communities, perhaps especially the tech community, be more effective at pushing back? And do you think that communities have been able to collectively define the solution to the problem that we discussed earlier about what we actually want 
facial recognition technology to do, given it's mm. being used on us? I think that's such a good, huge question. Um, and for me, pursuing freedom of information, I guess, kind of started as a curiosity and concern endeavor. Um, but, and we've already touched a bit on transparency and, and literacy. And I think that is such a key um, point of intervention for the, the tech community is our role in increasing literacy within our broader community and not just within tech, um, but in our broader social circles as well. So, and recognizing that our skill sets aren't just limited to writing code and building cool stuff, but also education and mentoring and communicating this kind of technology to a wider audience. And that's a really learned skill and it's difficult to think about how we can have these conversations about something as dystopian as facial recognition and surveillance without fostering a sense of futility as well in the people that we're talking to. Um, and uh, again, like I guess as technologists working in the private sector, we need to be a bit more vigilant about tempering the use of technology with risk and, and liability and those conversations around um, the commercial risks if we're working in the private sector. Um, there's also this kind of mentality that uh, tech people tend to have around kind of measure everything and then decide what to do with it later that looks like it's bleeding into the public sphere that I'd like to have more frank conversations about and maybe train ourselves out of that line of thinking and only capture what is necessary to do our jobs as tech people. And you say, you know, train ourselves out of that. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think that the, that the tech industry itself should be doing when it comes to regulating or changing the conversation around facial recognition? I mean, we did speak a little earlier about the way that Microsoft and Amazon and IBM have said, all right, we're going to stop working on facial recognition or we're going to stop selling services to these particular groups of people. Um, do you think that that's the right approach or do you think that there's something more that tech as an industry could, could do or should do? I think that's a, probably a pretty good start. I think it's so effective that the conversations in the US have resulted in IBM and Microsoft and Amazon publicly uh, refusing facial recognition technology from law enforcement. And I'd like us in Australia to get to that point as well. Um, I, I think there is definitely a lot more that um, it, you know, the tech industry can do in terms of bridging the gap with uh, tech journalists as well, if, if that is a, a, a difficult point to communicate the risks and um, uh, outcomes of this kind of technology and what surveillance means to the public, then we can link arms a lot more than we are doing now. Thank you. That's, um, that's really great. Um, I like that, the linking arms image too, although, you know, not very socially responsible at the moment, but we do our best. Yeah, yeah, virtual linkage. Yeah. Um, Jake, my next question's for you um, around uh, the capability. And um, I'd like you, if, if you can, <laughs> to give us a bit of an overview of what the capability is, just generally, um, if possible, um, just for attendees who may not be aware of it, but also to know a bit more about what, um, what the future of this might look like, because there was an attempt recently, there have been a couple, but recently um, this attempt to introduce facial recognition in Australia, it was knocked back for not being adequately transparent or privacy protecting. Um, so with another attempt to legislate the capability on the horizon, what should we be on the lookout for? And what might you know, robust and privacy enhancing regulation in this space look like? Okay. There's a lot in that. I'll uh, try not to take up too much. I know. Time. I'm giving everybody very easy questions. 
Um, just one, one thing before answering that is I'll say that Australia has been using facial recognition for a long time already, and it's, this is not necessarily uh, a law to introduce facial recognition on its own, and, and, and I'll get to why that's important in a second. Um, so uh, discussion about uh, biometrics interoperability has been in Australia, I think since around 2007. Uh, the, and, and there's sort of been, a, there was a framework introduced in 2012 and then in, I think it was 2014, we got what was called the facial recognition capability being launched, um, which was a, a, a cross-jurisdictional information sharing system. That's effectively what it's about. It's, a, it, it's, it's about producing a mechanism by which um, identity information can be uh, transmitted between jurisdictions in, within Australia. Uh, and then we sort of got a federal facial verification service, a one-to-one -one matching, I think around 2016, being done by the Attorney General's Department. Um, but that only used federal controlled images, which is passport images, which is about 50% of the Australian population. Federal agencies have been after driver's license images for a really long time. Uh, some of my earliest legal work was about that when I used to be a solicitor. And so uh, in 2017, there was this intergovernmental agreement between all the states and territories and the federal government effectively about producing a, 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 an information sharing system that would, um, that would use a, a federally orchestrated um, facial recognition tech identification service as part of a suite of identity matching services. And so there was this, this COAG agreement, which effectively set up like um, an infrastructure whereby all the states would have their driver's license images uh, as part of this sort of um, partition database that only the states would control. Um, and then uh, the attorney general's department would provide the facial recognition technology itself. They all agreed to that. Then the, the whole thing got taken over by the freshly launched Department of Home Affairs, which changed things pretty significantly. And then we saw a bill that, um, that, that wasn't exactly the same as the intergovernmental agreement. And what the bill did was kind of change the role of Home Affairs from infrastructure to pr provider to sort of information aggregator and, and, and centralizer. And so instead of like, providing this partitioned database that they had otherwise nothing to do with, all of a sudden Home Affairs was going to control everything. Now, the, the, the legislation that was going to introduce this got rejected by the, um, the parliamentary committee, the PCJIS, and um, they said it wasn't transparent or privacy protecting enough what they sort of suggested was that there was too much discretion left to home affairs and there wasn't enough um, oversight. But they never actually challenged this infrastructure on, on, like, a, 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 on its basic terms. So there was not really any commentary about what it means to, uh, to mix civic identity data and criminal identity data, what it means to fold these these state-based identity systems into the very data intensive um, apparatuses of a federal intelligence and security agency. And so I'm, I'm myself quite um, skeptical that um, the new version of the draft, even if it responds to the concerns of that report, will, um, will be meaningful, meaningfully privacy protective in, in, in any way. Um, and I think that um, the fact that this is talked about really as like a facial recognition issue kind of misses the point that this is a data governance issue and that um, behind this discussion of facial recognition is this massive rearrangement of um, data governance in Australia with respect to identity information. Um, really something very, very radical that flies in the face of like privacy ideas, democratic ideas, what the role of a state is supposed to be. And that's all gets kind of pushed to the side in the interest of like, oh, well, we, you know, make sure we don't do this and we make sure we don't do this. Um, so what is it? I, I actually don't know if we can have privacy protective, 
legislation around this issue because I think that um, the actual whole infrastructure being put in place is itself um, really, really problematic. Thanks. Um, great answer for a tricky question. I appreciate that so much. Mm. Um, just, uh, just so you know, we have about uh, 10 minutes left in this session. So I've got one more question just for the panel um, before we get to some of the questions that are coming in from our audience, which are really good questions that I would like to try and make some time to get into. Um, but my next question for all of you is about face, facial recognition in the context of COVID-19 and the way that we've reacted to that. We touched on this a little bit earlier, talking about the way that it is interesting to observe, particularly in Melbourne and now um, the rest of Victoria as of Sunday, I think, um, having to wear masks um, in public um, and contact tracing having made surveillance a lot more pervasive in, in many ways. Um, so this raises a few more questions about the efficacy of facial recognition, I think, and what it's used for. Um, there was something uh, someone mentioned in the, in the chat as well about the way that people are encouraging development of facial recognition technology for a no touch solution for things to open or close as a convenience thing upon recognition so that people don't have to touch things and make contact and transfer the virus that way. Um, so for all of you, just broadly, what do you think with the impact of COVID-19 in many of these ways, what do you think that the future of facial recognition tech might look like when facial rec when our face coverings are becoming the norm uh, and when we have more normalization of surveillance, uh, say through the, the COVID safe app and contact tracing in general, um, and the way that we might try to incorporate or people might be tempted to try and incorporate this as a convenience me mechanism. Yeah, if I can jump in first, I think it's quite poetic in a very 2020 way that face masks hinder facial recognition technology. Um, but it's, and Jake kind of touched on this, we need to be very mindful that facial recognition technology is just part of a much, much larger program of surveillance and a much, much larger program of biometric technology. And with sufficiently sophisticated tech, you don't need a face to recognize a person. We have other biometric data and gait recognition and temperature sensors, and it all gets like very dystopian very quickly. Um, so I think that it's, it's careful that this discussion captures that broader structural question of should governments or companies be building massive databases of biometric information in the first place? And I hope the answer is absolutely not. I mean, I agree with with all of that. And I just want to say there's been some interesting comments and questions that I've seen. people talking about um, COVID making things like facial, like habituating us to things like facial recognition, but like touchless access. And I think that's a really important thing that sort of picks up how a lot of this is vendor driven. And in, in the context of, of, of COVID-19, we're seeing like a lot of that, like all the, um, all the identity solution companies are like, ah, oh, we can do immunity passports now. Like people are, people are, are, are using this as an opportunity and um, the, the peculiar material conditions of our existence um, might feed into some of those things becoming more normalized at this time, yeah. Yeah, um, I think, uh, I don't know, there's a lot that could be said there um, that would probably take us on tangents that we have not enough time for at the moment. Um, what I'd like to do is just get into some of these questions that um, that we've got in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, so uh, not going in any particular order, I think uh, the main thing that's really been coming out is do we think that well-regulated facial recognition is possible or worth fighting for, or should we just ban this technology? It's a hard question. I, I want to get to talk about one thing. There's, I just feel um, 
it's so hard to talk about regulation because you have to ask which part because like the whole pipeline of facial recognition is polluted from start to finish you can even look at the data sets that are usually used to train um, facial recognition systems um, so uh, uh, there's actually like a lot of data sets but actually not that many in some ways a lot of these data sets are reused you know there's a one called duke mtmc i think which has been used just countless times by universities and private companies all over the world to train their systems. And that was collected at Duke University uh, quite a few years ago now. Um, about 2,000 faces of students there were captured. Um, and the university decided, I think, maybe last year that that was done without proper consent and the um, academics that collected it apologised. But that's just really the tip of the iceberg in terms of ethical collection and the way the systems are trained. I tried to get to the bottom of one last year that was collected at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Um, similarly, they just taped some cameras to, I think, a, like a cafeteria on campus and just collected images of faces and those same data sets have been used by academics here um, without having to jump through any ethical hoops because they didn't collect it themselves, um, the Australian academics here. So, you know, do we start there or do we start with the police use or do we start with 7-Eleven using it? Like just very difficult to know which part. I would say though that Australia does have a privacy framework and a lot of these ways that uh, say with the capability that we were just talking about, one of those uh, sort of principles of the Australian Privacy Act is that data should be used for the purpose for which it was collected and you need extra permissions to use it for another purpose in general. Um, so, I don't know how much we can rely on existing law if properly applied with the proper enforcement and the proper funding for our privacy watchdogs, if that would make a difference too. Yeah, I think it's important to note that with anything that emerges from the tech space, we have technology that is rapidly outpacing legislation and policy, just by the nature of how fast tech can move and how fast legislation can move. And so when the question comes up, like, should we ban facial recognition technology? I, yes, <laughs> like we, we don't have the community literacy to be able to have sufficient conversations about it or to be able to even make an informed decision yet about whether the degradation of our civil liberties is worth whatever benefits we're, we're getting from this kind of technology in, in our public spaces. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, 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 with all of that and don't, much, don't have much extra to add, except that um, if we're talking about regulating the technology, we just, we need to not think that banning facial recognition fi fixes any problem here. It, I mean, it fixes part of the problem, but this is a much bigger structural thing. And facial, re it's, you know, it's like the mushroom and facial recognition is just mm -hmm. like one little thing that pops up. But, there's so much more to it than that, just that simple application. Um, are there any particular questions um, in the chat that any of you have seen that you think you would um, like to be addressed in particular, just in the last couple of minutes? Just give you a minute to have a look. Mm -hmm. While we're here, um, Lizzie's just said the Australian Human Rights Commission has the Australian Human Rights Commissioner has called for a moratorium. Not sure that we should aim for anything less. Um, and uh, just on uh, speaking for Digital Rights Watch, um, at the moment we have a campaign going uh, to try and you know enforce that moratorium or campaign for it. Um, if you want to join the campaign, you can go to drw. FYI slash in dash your dash face. So drw.fyi slash slash in your face with hyphens in between. You can join the campaign there. There's one question in the chat around um, the that representatives from NEC, which is a big um, developer of facial recognition tech, said that one of the drivers behind take up might be convenience. Um, they use an analogy of online economy, you know. I guess, suppose like Facebook giving up data in exchange for connection, speed, access, et cetera. And um, 
I mean, I guess it's interesting. You did say at the beginning that we didn't, we're not talking about like using facial recognition to unlock your phone. Um, but I do wonder sometimes, and I don't ha pretend to have an answer about this, but whether those small moments of facial recognition working in a convenient way for people um, does start to uh, affect how they can visualise facial recognition in their own life. Um, and, you know, I think it'd be pretty hard to get people to give up face ID on their iPhones at this point, but I do want, yeah, I guess I'm not sure that um, that those little moments of convenience aren't colouring um, the discourse around facial recognition. It's either like such a benign, helpful use or it's like full um, Robocop. There's not like much in the middle. I was wondering how long it would get until someone mentioned Robocop. Thank you. <laughs> no, <laughs> someone has in chat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it definitely, um, those micro moments that you talk about definitely normalize surveillance to a point where having these kind of conversations and uh, talking about activism, it, it becomes a lot more difficult when the general public is just so comfortable with these technologies and, and think that their impacts are quite benign. Um, and it's two o'clock now, so we should start, we should finish wrapping up. Um, in that uh, in that vein, is there anything else that anything, anyone in particular wants to say, uh, starting with Jake? <laughs> um, no, I think it's been a really great conversation and thanks so much for having me. And it's been wonderful to talk to everyone and see all the, the, the chats and, and questions. Um, if I have like one leaving point, it's, um, I suppose to, 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 exert our political will here, but in a way that is not, um, that doesn't get sucked into framing things in terms of like privacy versus security or privacy versus health or privacy versus um, policing. Because I feel like once we do that, we kind of, we've, we've kind of skipped over the more important questions already. And um, instead of like setting up this binary of like what, what our rights can do for us uh, let's try and frame these conversations in, in, in terms that are more about collective governance. And I think that that, that will, you know, that, that's something to aspire to at least rather than always just having to fight this losing battle against, you know, what is just more and more and more surveillance really. Thank you. Um, Ariel? Um, yeah, not, not so much to add too. I guess I would just encourage it's, incumbent on me as a journalist to encourage you to tell me stuff so if you do uncover something I think I mean it's hard in Australia um, because of that lack of transparency that I mentioned to talk about facial recognition in a really tangible way for people you know, when you're trying to put together a story for tv online or radio it's those like personal stories that capture attention and so um, if you know there are opportunities for tips and like working with civil society which we do all the time in terms of finding those case studies, uncovering that information, and there can be quite a helpful relationship there in terms of merely bringing um, transparency to the situation. Okay, and Catherine, finally. Sure, uh, yeah, I just want to echo those sentiments. Thank you so much for hosting this conversation today and for so many people to show up who, who are passionate about these topics. I, I hope that the conversation continues. I feel like there is a, a lot more that we could have covered in an extra few hours, but I trust that there are enough angry, passionate people who will find each other afterwards and, and keep the conversation going. I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all of you for coming along today, um, to the panelists in particular. And um, for the rest of you uh, spending what is possibly your lunch hour with us. Um, thank you, especially to Keith Dodds for your very engaging, I think, and wonderful contributions to the chat. That's great. And I wish I could have responded more to that because um, that was really excellent and has facilitated a lot of conversation, which we would have many more hours to talk about. And thank you to Tom Solston also for being our invisible helper here and making us all look good on Zoom. <laughs> okay, well, I'll end it there. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.
Thanks so much.